If your parents didn't care for you properly when you were little, they didn't spend time with you, they didn't listen to you or teach you or respond to your need for love and protection, you may be struggling today with complex PTSD and in particular with distorted thinking about the problems in your life, relationships, money, the direction you'd like to be going versus where you're stuck. And CPTSD people often have distorted thinking about what part of these problems is other people's fault, which makes you furious, right? That they would do this to you. And what part you have the power to change. I used to have this too. It felt like Drama and trouble just flew to me. They just happened. And other people would get passed over for problems, but the problems found me. And it felt unfair, and I felt cursed. And I thought if other people would just change, I could change. I would be okay, but they wouldn't change. Now, it's true that a history of neglect or abuse does bring trouble into your life, but if it seems like you're stuck with 11 different problems and you're feeling helpless about them, there's probably at least one of them, probably more in fact, that you can change. And some of these problems are because you're not taking care of yourself and you're not holding boundaries, right? They're because you have a blind spot about what you can do and you're just waiting for this other person in your life to change. But the locus of control is in here. My letter today is from a woman I'll call Cassie. Her letter includes at the beginning some rough stuff about her childhood, so listen with care. She says, hi Anna, I had sexual abuse from family members at age five and then again at age 13. My mom and dad were okay growing up, although I was very sensitive and I felt like I was crying out for my parents' love and attention, and they were very detached. I circled that. I've got my fairy pencil here to circle things I wanna come back to. First, I'm just gonna read through Cassie's letter to see if I can help. Then we'll go back and talk about a few of the things I circled. All right. So Cassie says, my parents divorced when I was around eight and that's when things got really bad. My dad tricked my mom and she moved out and got married to an emotionally abusive man. My dad was cheating on my mom with a lady he worked with and it was a case of the grass is greener. At first, stepmom too was nice, but then she turned and was emotionally abusive to me. I lost myself and shut down. My dad didn't stand up for me and dealt with it by becoming an alcoholic. I started cutting myself and my stepmom saw and grabbed me and said, now we can't leave you alone and they dragged us out with them every weekend. No one asked me if I was sad or needed counseling. Mom divorced husband two and married three and has been with him for 20 years. He has CPTSD himself and chooses to cope by being mean. I know deep down that she loves me but is very detached emotionally. I have to force her to hug me when she comes over. Dad left wife number two when I was 14, she says. Then I became a party girl and was all about boys partying and drugs because I was finally allowed out of the house looking for love. I moved out of the state for a boy at 18 who I did really bad drugs with and moved back with a felony charge. <laughs> In fact, that boy just called me last week and I did not respond. I'm very proud of myself as he was always my limerence guy, which is so weird seeing as how he hurt me so bad. She says, and this is hard to hear, that she was also raped at age 15, 16, and 25. Anyway, she says, I struggled with more addiction issues in my 20s, but luckily made it through. I rushed into relationships and had lots of drama. I got hurt by many people and then I just became cold and started hurting people. Not on purpose, I just assumed no one was serious or really loved me. So I just figured I'd have fun in the moment but didn't think it would last long. I had a couple of half relationships in my early 30s with guys who didn't treat me right and I just got sick of it. I went to counseling for a couple of years and finally stopped feeling guilt for all the sexual abuse. My dad died from his alcoholism around eight years ago, as well as my alcoholic aunt who moved in when I was in high school. In fact, I have her cat now. I met my now husband after the last counseling appointment. 
I was clean, doing yoga at all the time, and truly the best I've ever felt. Through yoga, I also got interested in the spiritual stuff for the first time. We met on a dating app. He was really sweet and fun, and I fell hard for him. It was so great to finally be treated right. He got clean from alcohol before he met me, so it was really great. I had someone sober to have a great time with. We would listen to music and watch movies and just have a blast. I realize now, though, that we had sex too early, second date. Everything was good, though, and we got engaged after a year and moved in together. He was good to me. We got married three years ago. We keep having these huge arguments. I believe he has CPTSD, though he, has, he was taught to stuff his feelings and act like everything is fine. His mom has some mental disorder he can't think of the name of, and he still feels responsible for her and sends her money, which is really annoying to me. She wastes money and then ends up with no food. I have PMDD, that's premenstrual dysphoric disorder, so it'd be like very bad PMS. So two weeks before my period, I get dysregulated extremely easily. I'm often flooded with so many bad memories during that time. Also wanted to add, we started a business which I quit my full-time job for in 2020. Unfortunately, it's not going as well as I hoped it would, and debt is accumulating. I know he tries to show he loves me by doing house stuff and paying for things, but I want someone who tries to be there for me emotionally. I want to go out on dates and have fun, but he doesn't want to do anything. My true problem with my husband is he rages several times a day. For example, drops something and then screams a string of expletives. When I tell him this upsets me and gives me anxiety because of my dad's drinking rages, sometimes he says he'll try to work on it, and other times he says, I'm just getting it out, and then I'm over it, unlike, unlike me, she says. It makes me afraid to confront him. The other issue is he has ADHD and is either wired off meds or sleeping for 16 hours straight. Since I'm home more, the brunt of the household stuff falls on me, and he is also highly unorganized and messy, and it drives me crazy. I try my best to take care of him, but I'm resentful his family didn't teach him the basics of cleaning up after himself. When he sleeps for all that time, I feel like I'm wasting my life away, waiting for him to wake up. He says it's because he's up at 4 a.m. for work, for me. And she says parenthetically, I'm he pays most of the bills, but he'd be doing that even if he weren't with me. He said he wouldn't have this job. We don't sleep in the same bed and do everything separately, even things like grocery shop. I surprise him with things I know he'd like while he doesn't do that for me. He constantly teases me, which I really can't stand, especially during my premenstrual dysphoria, the PMDD time, like he doesn't know what else to say to me. I always warn him when I'm in PMDD time, and he just says, OK, although I've spelled out exactly what I need from him. More patience, affection, stop teasing me, etc. And after six years, he still doesn't get it, despite my sending articles for him to read, etc. I cry so hard when I read about people's boyfriends, husbands being so supportive during that time. I'm all alone, and that makes it even worse. Yesterday was our third anniversary, and he fell asleep from 5 p.m. to 8 a.m. I was so upset. I spent the night just watching TV by myself. The next day, I knew since I was in PMDD time, I was dysregulated, I was being quiet, so I wouldn't say something I'd regret. But I lost it over something stupid because I was waiting for him to make it up to me. I know that was wrong, and, I, and one minute later, I immediately apologized, but now it was too late. He rages and told me I should put my halo back on. <laughs> And the problem is I refuse to take meds for the PMDD. I've taken antidepressants in the past and had very negative side effects. I've called counselors over the past couple of weeks to try to get myself help, but they won't call me back, which is truly crazy. That's not my fault. But meanwhile, he wants to take meds for ADHD, but eats like crap, drinks diet soda, et cetera, et cetera. I eat healthfully and exercise. All he does is work and sleep and work on, house, on the house. I've been wanting to go to counseling, but we went before, and she was more like a career counselor in the end. And so that didn't work, so now he's against it. Obviously, we need to work on communication, but if all the relationship problems are because of my PMDD and I'm expecting to just suffer through his ADHD and carrying the mental load of everything, that's not fair. 
Anyway, I'm sorry about all the rambling, but I don't know what to do. I'd leave, but I have nowhere to go. Can't get a full-time job because I have to keep running the business until it sells. I have no income. I also just feel like such a failure. I had so many broken, failed relationships before him and felt like getting married was an accomplishment. I even wear my grandma's wedding ring. Some previous men I've dated also had rage issues and I don't get how I keep ending up with them. Obviously, if they were that rageful in the beginning, I'd walk away, but they're always really kind and nice. I have friends, but I'm not particularly close to them. If I could do anything I wanted, I'd move out of state or even country and start over and work on myself, but I can't afford that. I want to get away from everyone and everything. I cry for hours sometimes. I'm just tired of all the pain I've carried for so long. I'm 39 now. Please help. Sorry, this is so long. Thank you, Cassie. All right, Cassie. Ooh, this is a hard one, but I think I can help. All right. Let's see. Terrible childhood. I'm so sorry this happened to you. So right there, when people sexually abuse a child, the child loses clarity, boundaries, self-worth. You know, there's just like a really common pattern that happens there. Addictions appear, um, self-hatred appears, guilt, all the things that you named here. It's just common for anyone that that happens to. We just have to pick up where we are and begin the healing process. We, it, there's nothing else to do. So you have had a spell of doing that and I'm proud of you. Let's see if we can get you back on that track. All right. There's an odd little pattern I notice in, in your stories here. And it's where you talk about bad things that happen and when, then you want to explain why it happened, who was the cause of that. And you do this weird little end run. You do this thing where so-and-so did this bad behavior, but it was because this person did this, or it was because of this. And I just noticed that there's this, yeah, this little punt, this little dodge that you have when you explain why things happened. And they're not, you could be right, but when you say that um, your parents got divorced and your dad tricked your mom, he was having an affair, and then she got married to an emotionally abusive man, well, he may have tricked her, he may have cheated, he may have broken the vow, all of that. But when she got married to an emotionally abusive man, it's not, he didn't do that. He didn't do that. But it, you did that little twist there where it's like, he did that, so she married an emotionally abusive man. And the first stepmom was nice and then she was emotionally abusive. You lost yourself and shut down. Things got worse. He did, you say, You're, my dad didn't stand up for me and he dealt with it by becoming an alcoholic. Now, did he go to counseling with you and tell you that? It can happen to anybody. It's a combination of genetic predispositions. Sometimes it's because somebody's under pressure, but not everybody who does something bad, he was bad, he, he, he didn't stand up for you. Um, but that's not necessarily related. It, he didn't, it didn't cause him to become alcoholic. Uh, you know, he became alcoholic and probably the pattern of behaviors and thinking were already there and that's what caused him to not stand up for you. And that when people are in active alcoholism, they're selfish, they're self-centered, they can be quite cruel. They're, you know, the kids get swept aside and I know, so. Um, so your mom got divorced, she married a third guy, she's been with him, and you say that that guy chooses to cope with what you think is CPTSD by being mean. So again, this, this, there's this way that you rationalize what man, men do. I don't think anybody with CPTSD chooses their coping mechanism. It flies out of them. A little, we have a little power of choice, but being mean, it's not... Lashing out and um, being punishing or harsh or even abusive to other people is a sign of dysregulation that we have not restrained. That's what it is. It doesn't help you cope or anything. It just comes out. So I'm just trying to sort of decouple for you this idea that of cause and effect, you know, that he had CPTSD and he chose to cope by being mean. It's like a lot of people with CPTSD and being mean. So I'm not trying to invalidate you or minimize it at all. But just to say, I notice a pattern that you keep finding reasons for the way, for why men behave the way they do. And it seems to apply to the men mostly. So then you moved out, you got into bad drugs with some guy and 
came back with a felony charge. That's very serious. He just called you and you were proud. You didn't call him back. That is good. You were crazy about him. So that it had already started when you were that young that somebody got you in that level of trouble and yet you were limerent for them and that's how CPTSD works. There was your little brief comment and it's I know it's hard for everybody to hear. It's hard for me to hear, but you got raped three times, 15, 16, and 25. And what I'm wondering is because that could, that could happen to anybody. If it keeps happening, what I'm wondering is, did, did your CPTSD play a role in you being unable to hold boundaries around yourself? Did possibly drugs and alcohol play a role in you be, being unable to have boundaries, detect danger, get out of danger, um, uh, fight somebody off, stay conscious? Did that happen? I'm just wondering, again, not to minimize your experience, but I'm just seeing this pattern where more and more bad things happen to you and I'm, I'm just putting a little pin there to go, is there a way that you can get your agency back? Because this is what I'm seeing, Cassie. You have a concept that you have almost no agency. That's like the power to direct your own life. Like you're not seeing it. And I saw it in that little dodge about how you explained the, your dad's behavior in, the, in, in your childhood. Right here, it's as if bad things just keep happening to you. So you say you struggled with more addiction issues in your 20s, but you made it through. Lots of rushed relationship, lots of drama. That tends to go with addiction, and it tends to go with growing up with CPTSD. You got hurt by many people, and then I just became cold and started hurting people. Mm -hmm. Yes, I get it. Um, it wasn't on purpose. Thought you'd have fun in the moment, but you didn't think it would last so long. And then you had a couple of half relationships with guys who didn't treat you right, and you got sick of it. And you took space for six months and went to counseling for a couple years, and then you stopped feeling guilt for the sexual abuse. High five. You've, that's good. That's very good. And then your dad died of alcoholism eight years ago, and you had an aunt die of it. And you met your now husband after the last counseling appointment. And I circled that because I'm like, if there was ever a time when you should stay in counseling, it's when you get into a relationship. OK? So I just also had a question for you. Did you leave counseling when you met him because, A, you were worried the counselor would disapprove, or your CPTSD thought, oh, everything's great now? And I'm not making fun because I've totally been that person where you know, like I, I work on myself and then somebody new comes along and instantly I would drop it, you know, and just be like, my problem is solved right now. So I could just be projecting on you. So then you got into yoga. You, you were clean. You were doing yoga. It was the best you ever felt. Yay. And you got into the spiritual stuff, as you call it. And um, you met him on a dating app and it was really great at first. And after you say you slept together too fast. OK, a lot of people do. And then you got married after a year. And that was three years ago. So then you keep having these huge arguments. You think he has CPTSD, and he was taught to stuff his feelings and act like everything's fine. Yeah, some people have that, that style, and um, it's OK. It's OK to be that way. That's his style, not yours, OK? His mom has some mental disorder. He can't think of the name. He still feels responsible for her and sends her money. And, um, and you're really annoyed about that because she wastes the money and ends up with no food. I, I know what that's like when a relative is, uh, I've had it with a relative, not a spouse, but they're, they're spending money on somebody. I don't know, anytime you're trying to help somebody who, I guess she has a mental disorder. I understand though that he wants to help her. He wants her to have adequate money and he wants her to have food and yet she doesn't pull it together. So it, I'm just sort of saying, I, I sympathize with you, but I also sympathize with him on that. And then you have this um, premenstrual dysphoria disorder, and it's really bad. You can't get support for it. It's holding you back, and you don't want to take medication because you took antidepressants before. Um, and I really don't know about that. I can't give you any advice about that. I know that, yeah, a lot of people have a negative reaction to drugs, and they don't want to do it that way. But if it's holding down your life that much, you've got to do something. And I'm not, I'm not an expert on this PMDD. But I have a feeling 
that right now you're not really pursuing um, solutions for that as fully as you might, as fully as would be in your best interest, okay? And then you guys started a business, and that is a really hard thing for a couple to do, let alone a couple who's newly sober, who does not appear to, you didn't say anything about either one of you being in any kind of program of recovery. So that to me is like double red flag. I've had a lot of alcoholics and addicts in my life, and if they're not in a program recovery, even if they're in a program of recovery, they're vulnerable, they're volatile, they have a lot of healing to do, it can be hard to be in a relationship with them. There's a lot of ground to cover before somebody who's had an alcohol or drug problem Problem, including you is really capable of like a steady mature relationship that is mostly what I hear going on here your husband sounds depressed it sounds like he you know the ADHD and um, growing up what, what you think is CPTSD he's sleeping a lot I don't know what that is. is that drugs is it depression I don't know but you're not happy you married somebody optimistically who's turned out not to be somebody you respect or like that's what's basically going on here i just encourage you not to fault him like whatever's going on with him he only got sober right before he met you and now he's in a really difficult relationship and i just urge you to go to Alanon for his sake first of all to understand that what's going on with him related to his disease of alcoholism and or addiction is something he doesn't have total power over. He can't fix it so that you will be happy. In fact, the more that you're unhappy and you're hard on him, it's probably making it even harder for him. And I urge you not to be that person who makes it harder with your expectations. This is what's so hard about being with an alcoholic or an addict. It just seems like if they loved you, they would get it together and they would just do the proper, you know, tidy up after themselves, wake up at a normal time, celebrate an anniversary. But there are real problems here. And so people can't be forced to go through the motions of like being normal and happy when they're not feeling normal and happy. So the job in this situation is to face and accept what is about this relationship. You know, I don't doubt that you have some love for him, but, but you're holding him to a standard that was once in your mind, that was once in the past. This business sounds like a real bummer, and I have no idea what the details are, and there are people who you can confide in who can maybe help with that. There is also a 12-step program called Debtors Anonymous, and I would really encourage you to check that out. If you know, I, you sound like you qualify for like all the 12-step programs, or at least three. And I would prioritize the substance abuse. I feel worried about the am amount of stress you're in and how unhappy you are, given that you have a history of addiction. That's a really slippery slope to be on, and I just want you to be completely held in a group of people and or with professional help who understand that this is what you're going through and can support you to stay the path of sobriety. This is kind of where people go down. Don't let that happen to you. You know, maybe the marriage is gonna go to the side. The business will one day be gone <laughs> sooner or later and you will have your life ahead of you. But for that to go well, you're going to need your sobriety. So put that first. Debtors Anonymous, Al-Anon, those programs, those are places where for free, I know, see, because I'm hearing money is the problem here, there's no money, and that's okay. You don't need money to get help. You, you need willingness, and you need, like, I mean real, real willingness, not just like, I went for a while, you know, and then I tried this, and then I called for a couple weeks. It has been hard for people to get therapy lately. Um, there's a bit of a shortage. I think it's slightly getting better. Um, there's online therapy, but there's free 12-step groups and that it just whatever it takes so that each day you have support be willing to do that that is what it takes to get out of a pickle like you describe I've been in some very bad circumstances before and I'm telling you nothing less than what I did for myself and I'm so glad I did it and my only regret is that I waited so long to get serious about it to give it my all I suppose it's worth a try sometimes. You just think, well, maybe if I just do this much, because it's inconvenient, right? <laughs> to have to like get into recovery and work on yourself. You just kind of want to carry on, but it's time to give it your all, to put your heart into it, to make it the first priority in your life. Uh, 
I think when you're doing that, more clarity about your relationship will come and more support to decide what to do about the business. It just sounds like you really, you really, you want to be out of that marriage. You want to be out of that situation. And so in addition to addressing your sobriety, I encourage you to make the transition, whatever that looks like, so that you have a job and you are earning your own income once again. Because that's what a person needs if they're going to leave a relationship, is they need money. They need money, all right? That's just a practical thing. So if you're avoiding that transition of making money, it's just, it's like a very big thing holding you down in your current situation. So be brave about that. Be brave, get the support you need to take positive steps to move in that direction. The sending articles, um, feeling angry, yeah, um, you can let that go. You don't need to send any more art articles. Right now, I would say, as you work on figuring yourself what your next moves are and preparing yourself to make them, that you be as kind as possible. You stay safe. Like he rages at things. You didn't say anything where he rages at you. I hope, I hope he doesn't. It's time for one foot in front of the other. Self-care for you, Cassie. Self-care. Be as pleasant as you can. Um, he's fragile too. I'm sure you care about his, his long-term well-being. And I don't, you, I hear you, you cry for hours sometimes and you're tired of all the pain you've carried. Yes. So one thing that you can do on top of all of the things I've suggested with the therapy and the 12 step programs, come be in our membership program. It's a beautiful community of people, many of whom are in transition with their relationships and work and who support each other through the ups and the downs and the symptoms and the bad days and the good days through our CPTSD, that's what everybody has. So you'd be most welcome to come join the membership. You get access to all the classes. If anybody's wondering if having childhood trauma affected your romantic relationships, you can take a quiz on, on this very question, and I list a number of symptoms that show up in a person's life. You have a lot of them, Cassie. Uh, but these are the symptoms that show up in a person's life um, with CPTSD, and that quiz is available on the free tools page of my website. And you can also look at, do you have CPTSD? Are you dysregulated? And has it affected your ability to connect? Usually, most of us are affected in all of those areas. You can also find there my free course, The Daily Practice, and that is for anybody. It's a free course and it's a set of techniques that I used. I've been using them now for more than 28 years. I teach them to everybody. Thousands of people here on Crabby Childhood Ferry have learned them, are doing them, are getting together in groups to do them, and they help calm the emotional intensity and bring you back into a state of regulation. I think you might like it. It's free, and once you sign up for it, you can learn and try the techniques in less than an hour, and if you do that, once you're on the mail list, every two weeks I send an invitation to my free Zoom calls where anyone who's learned the techniques can come join me on Zoom and we use the techniques together and I take questions. And so that's an opportunity for anybody. If you wanna ask me a question, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, that's where I'll be. So come join me. I'll put the link down below in the description section too. If you resonate with Cassie's situation, I have a video that's about the number one thing that it, with CPTSD that keeps people miserable. I think it's relevant to you, Cassie. I've got that video lined up right here, and I will see you very soon.